Hi, everybody. Welcome to session 2.5. Um, we are now escaping the federal income tax. Some of you may be shouting joyfully, but don't shout too soon because we still have other taxes to talk about. Actually, what's funny about this is that we spend four class sessions talking about the federal income tax, and we are going to spend only one class session talking about every other tax that relates to nonprofits. That's how complicated and potent the federal income tax law is for the nonprofit sector. All the other taxes that might apply to a nonprofit come and it, it come in smaller doses of complexity, and we can talk about them all just in one class session. It's pretty awesome. We're going to talk about the property tax at the state level and how charities can be exempt there. Also, the sales tax at the state level and how charities are exempt there. And then we're going to be talking about employment taxes and the withholding requirements that nonprofits have to abide by. Uh, if you remember, I said at the beginning of the semester, the employment tax is the one tax that ch charities can never really be exempt from. Um, what will be important in that context is not just to tell you that you have to pay employment taxes, but also that you understand the difference between an employee and an independent contractor as far as the law is concerned. Okay, so let's start off with property taxes. Um, all 50 states have a property tax exemption for charitable uses, meaning that if you're if you're using property like real estate for charity, like a school, a boys and girls club, a hospital, well, hospitals are tricky. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But like a school, a boys and girls club, a church, um, then uh, all states allow a process for you to get exempt uh, from that property tax. Most state constitutions actually include an exemption, it requiring it or permitting it. Um, that the that charities are exempt from paying property taxes. And then states have, where it is in the Constitution, states usually have clarifying statutes um, that establish the exemption. So if you look at Utah's law, for example, the Constitution, it, when it lists the properties that can be excluded from property tax, it includes property owned by a nonprofit entity used exclusively for religious, charitable, or educational purposes, the legislature has enacted a property tax exemption law that says exempt property includes property owned by a nonprofit entity, which is used exclusively for religious, charitable, or educational purposes. I mean, that only difference is the which is, and that's just based on the context of the wording. So essentially, Utah law allows for religious, charitable, and educational uses of property to be exempt from property taxes. What is not in that list is healthcare. It's healthcare, providing healthcare is not a religious activity, nor is it an educational activity. And for a while there, people assumed that healthcare was a charitable activity. And they assumed it because the federal tax code says that providing healthcare is a charitable activity. But then um, a couple decades ago in Utah, um, Utah County looked at all of this big, fancy, expensive property that was owned by Intermountain Healthcare and said, hey, wait a minute, why do they get a property tax exemption? The law in Utah says religious, charitable, or educational. It doesn't say healthcare. And we don't think healthcare is charitable. Intermountain Healthcare responded by saying, well, of course it's charitable. The federal government calls it charitable. And that case went all the way to the Utah State Supreme Court, and Utah County won. The state Supreme Court said, look, the legislature has never said that health care is considered charitable, and we don't care if the federal government says that it is because their laws are different than our laws. As a state, we get to decide our own laws at the state level. Property tax is a state law issue. And nowhere anywhere has anybody said that health care is charitable, so we're not going to assume that it is. It's not obviously charitable. It doesn't matter the federal government says it's charitable. And so what this means is that Healthcare doesn't get a property tax exemption. Now, if you're in a mountain healthcare, a huge organization with a lot of very expensive property, this is a bombshell of a ruling. And remember, this ruling happened at the Utah State Supreme Court, so they can't appeal anywhere. That's the final, that's, they're the final arbiter of Utah state law. So you'd wonder then, why is it that Intermountain Healthcare still doesn't have to pay property taxes? Because they don't. And the answer is, they after they lost that case at the Supreme Court level, they went over to the Utah State Tax Commission and they said, okay, your definition of charity is providing 
services to the poor. Well, guess what? We provide millions of dollars every year in free health care. Usually it's provided in the form of forgiving medical debt, but it still counts. And so they brought this tabulation of all the free medical care that they provide. And the state tax commission said, yeah, you're right. Okay, we're giving you property tax exemption based on that premise. And this case was so important because it, it, it set a precedent that, um, that influenced cases around the country. And so in most states, hospitals are considered charitable for tax purposes, but only under the condition that they're providing more care for free than they would be charged for their property tax. And that's true for intermountain health care. If, if the amount of free care they provided ever dipped below what their property tax bill would otherwise be, then they're going to have to pay property taxes. And so this is an incentive for intermountain to pay, provide a lot of free care. Um, at the last time I checked was in 2011, so it's been a while now. But that year, IHC provided $175 million in charitable assistance <clears throat> involving about 256,000 cases. Okay. So if you want to be exempt as a charity, be the charity from property taxes, there are two things you have to do. One, you have to make sure that you are the owner and the user of the property. Property that's not owned and used by the charity cannot be considered tax exempt. And so, for example, um, you might rent uh, the space you operate in as a charity. Well, if that's the case, we've broken up the identity of ownership and use. That means the landlord can't go get tax exemption for, for the property that they're renting to you. And the inverse is true. If you're a charity and you have some property, but you're renting it out to a business, you can't, you, that, then that property carries property tax. That property will have to pay property tax as well. And then the other thing is it has to be actual use, which means that if the property is sitting idle, meaning it's not engaged in a charitable activity, then um, you still have to pay a property tax on that. If you drive around uh, pretty well-established neighborhoods in Utah County, you're likely to find big empty lots in the middle of these neighborhoods that have been built out for at least 20 years. And you wonder, how in the world is that lot still empty? If you look at it, though, you might notice that that lot is roughly church-shaped and church-sized, meaning you could drop a chapel down right in the middle of that lot and it would fit perfectly. And that's because it's likely that the church owns that property and it's holding it in reserve just in case they need to build a chapel later if membership in the area were to grow and outgrow the building space they already have. Those empty lots um, are lots for which the church has to pay property taxes. And it's because those lots are not in actual use for a religious purpose. And so once they build a chapel there, then the property tax goes away. But until they build a chapel, they have to pay a property tax because they don't follow the second requirement of actual use. Property tax exemption for charities has issues, and, and it has issues for a few reasons. Number one is that local governments are forced to either forego revenue or raise rates. I mean, think about how much Utah County would love to collect taxes on Intermountain's um, uh, uh, Utah Valley Regional Medical Center. I mean, that is really primo real estate. And, and Utah County could charge quite a hefty bill there. Now, because they can't charge property tax on that space, it means they have two options. They either give up on the revenue, which probably means cutting services, or they raise property tax rates on everybody else, which is what they tend to do. And now all the rest of us are subsidizing Intermountain Healthcare. And it's not just in the sense that they don't have to pay property taxes, but Intermountain and the church and everybody else who gets this exemption also enjoys free public services. Every time a church is vandalized, police respond. And this is a police response that the church is not paid for. Same is true for Intermountain. Same is true for private schools that are, that are nonprofits. They don't pay a property tax, which means they're not helping pay for the police force or the public safety officers that are keeping our county safe. Um, and there are some charities that are commercially inclined, like Intermountain Healthcare, or that are politically unpopular in Utah. For example, there might, you know, a, a Planned Parenthood clinic might have issues um, with public approval, and that's another way that that it becomes politically unpopular. 
Now, there are ways that localities still try to get their money. And if this next explanation sounds like extortion, that's because it kind of is. Not in a legal sense, but in a practical sense, it sure as heck feels like it. See, because what localities do is they, they try to extract what are called pilots and silots. And this is where they convince the nonprofit to give a payment in lieu of taxes or services in lieu of taxes. And the way it works is this way. It's kind of like protection money. What happens is the, the government officials go down to the nonprofit and they say, hey, this is a nice property tax exemption you've got going here. Wouldn't it be a shame if somebody were to challenge that in court? Well, obviously, that'd be a very expensive lawsuit for the nonprofit to defend. So the nonprofit goes and replies to the government officials, boy, we would really hate for that to happen. How can we avoid that? And the government official says, well, we'll tell you what. If you pay us a certain amount of money, we promise not to sue you for your property tax exemption. And then the nonprofit thinks about it and says, boy, this is shady stuff, but our lawyers tell us it's legal. And so we're going to pay because we don't want to pay a property tax. So we're just going to pay this pilot and you promise to go away. And that's what happens. And this is a hundred percent legal process. There's nothing keeping it from happening other than politics. And, and, uh, there are some cities that are notorious for this, like Philadelphia. Oh my gosh. Philadelphia has been extracting pilots from their nonprofits for years now. Sometimes pilots are paid voluntarily because of the public perception benefit that results from it. Um, the church has done this in Salt Lake on multiple occasions, is my understanding, because they own a lot of very expensive real estate up in Salt Lake City, and so they will make payments from time to time on, under specific circumstances, like when North Temple was uh, bought by the church to put the reflecting pool next to the Salt Lake Temple. Uh, my understanding is that there was also a pilot that came along with that. Another way that localities get their money is through changing away from taxes over to user fees and special assessments, where you don't charge a tax to fund services like sewage and, and, and so forth. You instead charge a fee or have a special one-time assessment that doesn't technically count as a tax. Okay, let's talk about sales taxes. This one is easy. Basically, there are two ways that charities can be exempt from a sales tax. The important concept to understand is that Although we pay sales taxes at the register, the legal obligation for a sales tax is with the store owner. It's the sellers of goods and services that carry a sales tax that have to pay the tax to the state. It's not the purchasers. The only reason we pay the sales tax as purchasers is because the law allows sellers to pass the sales tax on to us as long as they itemize it on the receipt. And so that's how it generally works as the sales tax gets passed along but it's really the sellers that have the final legal obligation. So there are two ways that charities can get exemption from paying sales taxes. One is if they're a seller. So if they make a sale that furthers the charitable purpose, then they can be exempt from paying sales taxes. This is why if you buy food on campus and you use your student ID, you don't have to pay a sales tax because selling food to students furthers the charitable purpose. And when you use your ID, you're proving that you're a student, and that's why you don't pay a sales tax. So you should always have your student ID handy when you buy things on campus because you could save sales tax in the process. BYU then, on this sale, because it's furthering a charitable purpose, doesn't have to collect a sales tax. And because they don't have to collect the sales tax, they don't have to pay it to the state. But sometimes, you know, a BYU employee might go to Costco to buy cookies for a party or something like that. <clears throat> well, Costco is going to... <clears throat> charge the sales tax to, to BYU, what BYU can do is, uh, well, one of two things. They can add up all the sales tax that they've paid over the year, and then they file for a refund from the state. So if you've ever had to do a church reimbursement form, for example, and you had to itemize the sales tax on, the, uh, on your reimbursement form, it's because that number gets put into the total that the church then uses to get reimbursed at the end of the year from the state tax commission. Another option is you could convince the store owner not to charge the sales tax at the register. So if you have an account somewhere, like our local grocery store has accounts for all of the wards, and if you go in and say, hey, I'm buying this for my ward, and it gets charged to the ward account, then they also don't charge a sales tax at the purchase. And that's another way you can be exempt as a charity buyer. 
and that's it. That's it as far as the exemption goes for the sales tax. There are two ways you can be exempt, as a charity seller or as a charity buyer. And uh, the, the rules are essentially the same in both cases. Okay, so let's t talk last about employment taxes and how withholdings work. Um, basically, when you employ people, the government requires you to engage in, in, uh, in uh, certain taxes and withholdings that relate to taxes for the, for the employees. So these employment taxes are, imp are imposed at both the state and federal level. They include Social Security, Medicare. You have to do income tax withholdings for the employees. And usually you have to pay an unemployment insurance. Um, uh, all nonprofits that have employees pay employment taxes. There's no way to get out of it. Um, some states, including Utah, allow charities to self-fund unemployment insurance. So if somebody makes an unemployment insurance claim, you, if you lay somebody off, they might make an unemployment claim. And if they make an unemployment claim, generally, if you are like most organizations, that claim goes against the state unemployment insurance fund. But if you as a nonprofit chose to self-fund, when you lay somebody off, you're basically going to keep paying them for not working. You're going to be paying out of your bank account is how that works. So it's usually only large nonprofits that self-fund because it's cheaper for them to set aside a layoff fund than it is for them to pay into the state unemployment fund. Workers' compensation is another legal requirement that acts like a tax. It's not a tax per se, but it is another cost of employing people is making sure you have workers' comp insurance. So if you have to pay employment taxes, um, this is the stuff that funds Medicare and Medicaid, and if you're an employer, you're paying half of the burden. It incentivizes you not to employ anybody. You'd rather just treat everyone as an independent contractor because if you treat them as an independent contractor, the tax burden falls on them entirely. Well, the law doesn't let you get away with that. You can't just call somebody a contractor and then the law agrees with you. Um, there are rules for determining who's an employee and who's a contractor, and it's biased in favor of treating people like employees. The IRS is going to look at three things to make that determination. They're going to look at behavioral control, meaning how closely does the employer control the worker's activities. The more closely they control those activities, the more likely it is that that person is an employee. They're going to look at financial control. How much does the employer control the worker's compensation? If you pay them hourly and you provide benefits, odds are they're an employee. If you pay them a commission and, and they could some month make a lot by selling a lot, some, make, some months make not very much at all by, by selling very little, then that's more likely to be an independent contractor. And then they're going to look at the type of the relationship. And they're going to look at how the employer and the worker and even the industry practice uh, views the relationship. And so if they work in a job that's often independent, like a lawyer or an accountant or um, a cleaning service or, or, or things like that, these are where it's common to use independent contractors, then you might get away with it. But there are other jobs that are deeply integrated in a company that, uh, that are much more likely to be employee-based. And in that case, you have to treat them like employees in the way that you pay them. Um, so just to kind of illustrate, you know, if an employment agreement requires a worker complete a regularly provided list of tasks in a manner that the employer describes, then that person cannot be an independent contractor. They need to be an employee. If the worker is paid biweekly and receives no performance-based compensation, then they're not an independent contractor. They're probably an employee. And then if the worker performs an essential function to the company in a provided office facility and they get financial benefits like insurance premiums paid, in addition to the regular compensation, that also sounds like an employee, so that person cannot be an independent contractor. It's important to be careful with this. A lot of organizations fail at this, and because they fail it, they face pretty stiff penalties from the IRS. And so you have to be careful that you have a tendency to treat people like employees instead of independent contractors. And if you're ever not sure, the advice is to consult your tax professional. And that is session 2.5. See you all in class.